today we're here on Martin Luther King Jr. Drive fighting the blight. We're getting ready to demolish this old abandoned gas station that has been vacant since 2015. As you know, Martin Luther King Jr. Drive has nearly $40 million in streetscapes. We have new sidewalks, we have new lights, we have new art. So we want to make, to make sure that we continue to fight the blight right here at this old abandoned shell gas station that has been vacant since 2015. As my neighbors go back and forth traveling Martin Luther King Jr. Drive, they kept saying, we've got to get it down. We've got to get it down. So I want to thank everyone that played a part and especially major management company for coming out and stepping up in this community so that we can rebuild this gas station that will have brand new security cameras and they have even agreed to hire young people from this very community where I was born and raised. Out here at Southside Park in my district, of course, District 12. I'm so proud to be out here at this great park and we do a lot of great things. But what we're out here today for is actually another amenity that we've already put in the park of mountain bike trails. I don't know if folks know, but Southside Park is officially a mountain bike trail, the first in the city of Atlanta. So I'm very proud of that. We did that about two years ago. But what we're doing today is we've had donors who are actually donating bikes to our kids in our community who are actually getting ready to train them to do mountain bike, how to ride mountains in a bike trail in Southside Park. Now mountain bike biking is different than just riding a bike on the street. We're going up through hills and doing a lot of different things. And so today we have a great sponsor who've actually given us funding for I believe 50 mountain bikes. And so we're out here today with our kids celebrating. One, two, three, cut. So today we're having an exciting ribbon cutting at Melvin Drive Park. Long overdue, there are so many beautiful updates that we've done here in the community. And guess what, the community led most of it. They've captured so many dollars outside of our, our actual budget from Park Pride, from Home Depot. Um, and so the city of Atlanta is partnering really with the community to make sure that Melvin Drive looks fantastic. The, the actual tennis courts look great. We've got a re total revamp on the, the Hawks basketball court. We've got a new trail that went in over here and the children are playing on new playground equipment. We've got exercise equipment throughout the park. It's so many nice things happening at Melvin Drive Park and I'm excited. The mayor is here to do a ribbon cutting with us just so that the community knows that this partnership is everything. This is what it takes in order for us to uh, make our lifestyles wonderful here in Southwest Atlanta. We even had the Thero Cluster show up to root us on in taking care of our parks here in Southwest Atlanta. Thero High School principal Dr. Powell is here. Thicket principal's here. You know, it's it's just a good day. Ishe Collins is here. Uh, and she's our board chair representative of uh, the Thero Cluster. She's here too because it's important that we support our neighborhoods and our children in the community. It's just a really good morning um, and we're just happy to, to be here. We are here at Southside Park in my district, of course, District 12. I'm so proud to be out here at this great park and we do a lot of great things. But what we are here today for is actually another amenity that we've already put in the park of mountain bike trails. I don't know if folks know, but Southside Park is officially a mountain bike trail, the first in the city of Atlanta. So I'm very proud of that. We did that about two years ago. But what we're doing today is we've had donors who are actually donating bikes to our kids in our community who are actually getting ready to train them to do mountain bike, how to ride mountains in a bike trail in Southside Park. Now mountain bike biking is different than just riding a bike on the street. 
you're going up through hills and doing a lot of different things. And so today we have a great sponsor who's actually given us funding for, I believe, 50 mountain bikes. And so we're out here today with our kids celebrating. Even though it's overcast, this is an incredibly exciting day. Um, DeKalb Ave has been a dangerous street on the east side of Atlanta for a long, long time. Uh, and I am super excited that we're breaking ground on phase one today, um, making this safer for the neighborhoods to touch it on both sides, for folks who ride MARTA or who cycle down on their way to or from downtown. Um, but I want to underscore that this is just phase one, um, that there is unfinished work that we have here. and. It'll be important to pass a new TSPLOS and a new infrastructure bond next spring um, so we can do the full project um, and give our residents what they deserve. It's all part of the larger, you know, honestly, the Vision Zero um, of making sure that no Atlanta resident is injured or dies um, on our streets. And today's groundbreaking is a step in making sure that that doesn't happen again on DeKalb Ave. Chastain Park is the largest park in the city of Atlanta. Uh, this is the last piece of the Chastain Park path and it's taken over 25 years since it began and we are here at a groundbreaking to celebrate this last piece getting ready to uh, start. Uh, you know the phrase it takes a village, well it certainly takes a village here. There have been lots and lots of organizations who have helped make this happen. I think there are over half a million people and probably about a quarter of a million dogs that uh, use the path each year. It's an asset that is um, used by many, many people from young people walking along to people on bikes to people running and exercising and folks coming after work to enjoy a stroll in the park. And the path has really been a uh, catalyst for revitalizing the park and so lots of park partners here today with uh, NYO and the horse park and the pool and uh, it's a wonderful time to celebrate together. One, two, three. We're here for the launch finally of the beginning of the complete street for improvements along the Cab Avenue. This project is very, very important. It falls into the category of promises made being promises kept. There's been a lot of charrettes and community engagement around improvements to this district. It's been fits and starts around implementation and scope. We finally have a scope. We finally have allocation of funding. They've selected the contractor. We are finally getting started. This is an important corridor that connects DeKalb County to Atlanta, it connects to Stone Mountain and some other bikes and trails, so this is a very, very important corridor. This is phase one. We're looking forward to having phase two happen in the near future, but we're excited to finally have a start to a very important project. Today we're here on Martin Luther King Jr. Drive fighting the blight. We're getting ready to demolish this old abandoned gas station that has been vacant since 2015. As you know, Martin Luther King Jr. Drive has nearly $40 million in streetscapes. We have new sidewalks, we have new lights, we have new art. So we want to make, to make sure that we continue to fight the blight right here at this old abandoned shell gas station that has been vacant since 2015. As my neighbors go back and forth traveling Martin Luther King Jr. Drive, they kept saying, we've got to get it down. We've got to get it down. So I want to thank everyone that played a part in especially major management company for coming out and stepping up in this community so that we can rebuild this gas station that will have brand new security cameras. And they have even agreed to hire young people from this very community where I was born and raised. One, two, three, cut. 
So today we're having an exciting ribbon cutting at Melvin Drive Park. Long overdue, there are so many beautiful updates that we've done here in the community. And guess what, the community led most of it. They've captured so many dollars outside of our, our actual budget from Park Pride, from Home Depot. Um, and so the city of Atlanta is partnering really with the community to make sure that Melvin Drive looks fantastic. The, the actual tennis courts look great. We've got a re total revamp on the, the Hawks basketball court. We've got a new trail that went in over here and the children are playing on new playground equipment. We've got exercise equipment throughout the park. It's so many nice things happening at Melvin Drive Park and I'm excited. The mayor is here to do a ribbon cutting with us just so that the community knows that this partnership is everything. This is what it takes in order for us to uh, make our lifestyles wonderful here in Southwest Atlanta. We even had the Thero Cluster show up to root us on in taking care of our parks here in Southwest Atlanta. Thero High School Good morning. It is uh, 10 o'clock and uh, it is Tuesday, October 12, 2021. My name is J.P. Masakite. I am pinch hitting for uh, the Honorable Madeline Mose B. Archibald at today's City Utilities meeting. Um, I do want to call this meeting to order and ask Ms. Kimson Wright if she would do a roll call, please. Um, yes, Mr. Chair. Councilmember Madeline Mosey Archibald. Councilmember Andrea L. Boone. Councilmember Dustin Hillis. Present. Councilmember J.P. Mazakite. Oh, of course you're present. <laughs> Councilmember Joyce M. Shepherd. Councilmember Howard Schiff. Councilmember Cleta Winslow. Present. Mr. Chair, we don't have a quorum present that has actually um, stated they're present. Um, would you like me to just confirm? Uh, and want to that'd, that'd be great uh, if you could, please. Okay. Um, Councilmember Archibald. Councilmember Boone. Councilmember Hillis. Present. Councilmember Shepard. Councilmember Shook. Um, and Councilmember Winslow. Present. All right, um, so we don't have a quorum, we're missing one, is that correct? Yes. There three um, yes. And okay. uh, I, I believe Council Member should have just joined. Um, the public line, we need to get them over to, there may have been a mix up with the line. Okay. While well, we're waiting on that, okay. Okay. Um, there we go. Yeah. Sorry, I'll switch over. I um, believe I heard Council Member Shook. Yes. All right, so we, ha we have a quorum then, Ms. Uh, Kimson, right? We do have a quorum. All right, great. If you could please read the uh, remote meeting statement. This City Utilities Committee meeting is being conducted remotely. As advertised and as in accordance with Official Code of Georgia 5014-1, the meeting will be conducted in conformance with Robert's Rules of Order and the Rules of Council as authorized by the City Code. The public may access the meeting by the following conference bridge, 
Toll free access 404-902-5066, conference ID 151-945, which was noted on the Friday, October 8th, public meeting notice. The public may also view the meeting on Channel 26, City Council Atlanta GA.gov, or the Council's YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter pages via at ATO Council. All presentations are available on the Atlanta City Council City Utilities Committee presentation page. The agenda was published and made available on Friday, September 24th via Atlanta, I'm sorry, on Friday, October 8th via atlantacityga.itm2.com. Public comment was accepted between the hours of 4 p.m. and 7 p.m. on yesterday, Monday, October 11th. All persons present on the presentation conference bridge are requested to mute your phones and speakers. Additionally, speakers must be acknowledged by the presiding officer prior to speaking. Each council member is requested to open your Outlook email and minimize the screen to view amendments, substitutes, and informational documents which were distributed to you earlier. Thank you all in advance for your cooperation. Thank you, Ms. Kimson Wright. Um, next item is the adoption of the agenda. And there are a couple of um, modifications. One is the People TV update uh, is going to be um, rescheduled to a later time. So they'll have two updates, the Department of Public Works and the Clean Energy Plan update. Um, I'd like to go ahead and, and uh, do the legislative items. There aren't that many legislative items. We'll go ahead and take those first, and then we'll go to our presentations. So I'll make that modification to the agenda. I'll make a motion to approve the modified agenda. Second, Chuck. The vote is open. <laughs> Councilmember Lenslow? In favor. The vote is closed. Four yeas, zero nays. The agenda has been adopted. All right. Four yeas, zero nays. Uh, next item is um, the adoption of the minutes. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. The vote is open. Council Member Winslow? In favor. The vote is closed. 4 yeas, 0 nays. The minutes have been approved. All right, four yeas, zero nays. Uh, the minutes are approved. Next item is public comment. If you could please play the public comment. Do you know how many we have, Ms. Kimson, right? Um, yes, we have three comments, um, roughly right at six minutes. Great, thank you very much. If you could please play those. One moment, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Council. Um, this is Adrian Coleman calling back. I'm sorry, I got disconnected, and I hope you'll allow my comments to continue. According to Atlanta's Open Checkbook, the city of Atlanta has paid over $750,000 to People TV in the past four years. However, People TV has um, not conducted um, an independent audit um, as required by their bylaws and by contract with the city. In addition, they have failed to file federal taxes for the past four years. And so I'm as calling this morning to ask the City Utilities Committee to consider authorizing the Atlanta Audit Department to do an audit of People TV, as well as to request the Office of Contract Compliance to do an inspection, which is allowed in the contract, to do an inspection of the records at People TV, and to report back to the City Utilities Committee in terms of their findings. The third thing that I would like to ask of the city is that you provide a work session or a public hearing from the producers and the community in terms of the impact of, of what's happening at People TV. We have not, the board of directors has been absent and has not provided the community with a way to be able to provide input to them or to voice their concerns. Lastly, what you should know is that People TV um, has um, eliminated some staff 
that was essential to the operations, particularly the operations manager. And at the last board meeting, Ms. Creighton, the PM of People TV, reported that People TV now has eight programming, eight programs, eight, which not all of them are produced by local people. Some are produced from out of state. As you're aware that the number of hours of new programming is required eight hours weekly with Comcast franchise agreements. So at this point, we're at risk of losing the public access station if the programming is not uh, sufficient. So again, thank you for listening, and I hope you will um, take this under advisement. Have a good day. Good morning. My name is Adrian Coleman Tyler, and I'm calling to make comments regarding People TV. March of 2021, Mayor Bottoms executed a one-year contract with People TV to operate the public access channel, Comcast Channel 24. At the time that Mayor Bottoms executed that contract, People TV was three months in arrears in their rent to Selig Enterprises. Six months later, September 15th, at the regular board meeting, the treasurer, Calvin Vismil, reported to the board that People TV was again three months in arrears on their rent to Selig and that they had a bank balance of $37,000 owing Selig $27,000 to $29,000 in back rent. Essentially, People TV is broke and without money. They have an outstanding loan with the SBA of $107,000. And that is probably not the totality of their liabilities that's owed. Greetings, council members and staff. A special greeting to you citizens and voters of Atlanta who are following your government in action and how to be the advocate public policy analyst. Now comes the general manager of People TV with another quote, People TV update, unquote. You may hear that the third quarter income taxes to IRS have been paid, but you won't hear how the fourth quarter taxes are going to be paid. You may hear that People TV board meetings are going, quote, just fine, unquote. You won't hear that at the September 15th board meeting, the general manager chose not to even put unfinished business on the agenda, and none of the board members complained about the absence of unfinished business. You may hear that the general manager chose to remove the name of Ron Secure on the list of People TV board members because he's running in a, a contested city race. You won't hear that the general manager is conducting a full-time campaign to be a member of the Atlanta Board of Education at the same time she's supposed to be engaged in full-time work at People TV. You may hear talk about moving People TV to another location. You won't hear any talk about what it costs to move all of that expensive equipment into the proposed smaller space or how much it will cost to make the necessary modifications to the new building. And you won't hear anything about where the money for that move is coming from. You won't hear anything about the general manager's flaunting of the city's open records request system. And you won't hear any talk about getting those city appointed positions filled on the board to help straighten people TV out. Because once people TV is straightened out, the general manager knows when programs like NPU on TV can shine light on the NPU online operations and expose Anthony Robinson, Paul Flair, Ricardo Jacobs, and let those Scott, Albert White, Allison Hathaway, Sherry Williams, Agent X, and the NPU online cohort in April and Corbin. I am brother and only who come a soulful spiritual being as a human experience. Now I say I'm true. In the future, commit an angst to the creator we call which group and you call God with every consciousness. Every being is expected in a tiny spot from their supreme consciousness. It has been over a year of the intelligence. And I have asked you all to 
investigate and, and have the interpretation. This one is where the representatives of the Department of Public Security to look at a problem that we have in our education due to not getting adequate service from the Department of Public Work. They had a room, they had fields, waste on it due to a public truck, waste from on the back of the trash chute. Over a year, that's literally messed up in the front. What about you, the city utility committee? I give it to you, I come on the department. I know what I mean, but the channel, listen to this. I had talked to Mr. Bill Ellis in the last two years. I've been going back to the Jackson Center at dinner. I've been talking to Megan Carl, as I do, about what the revenue has been paying Southeast of Country Parkway three or four times. In the last 10 years, they don't have to have their first tenure on Mr. B. Ellis, but they have both the sign, and they have already finished it. It's been the first time of this school that B. Ellis came on, come to the room, just the two representatives have been on the way to top three, probably, but the road to the tail road in a session where I live. Why do I speak about this? The transparency of my in South Fulton and Southern representatives for the country. Then I think the work. They are representatives of the county and city of Atlanta. And then you can't even get to commit a new to collaborate together to make sure adequate services, adequate resources. All right, that concludes our public comment. Did want to share that we have been joined by Council Member Boone, who I believe was uh, on mute um, before. So, welcome, Council Member Boone. The next. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Good morning. We will move to our legislative items and first our ordinances for first read. Ms. Kimson Wright, if you could please read in 210779. Yes, this is an ordinance by City Utilities Committee to ratify services rendered in connection with Agreement FC 1190024, Green Infrastructure Design Challenge, Cassane Park with R2C Incorporated beginning August 12, 2021, and to authorize the mayor or her designee to execute the First Amendment to the agreement to correct the name of the contractor and to extend the term of the agreement retroactively effective from August 12, 2021 through January 31, 2020 at no additional cost on behalf of the Department of Watershed Management in accordance with Section 21163, subsection C of Article 10 for the Real Estate Code of the City of Atlanta Code of Ordinances and for the purposes. Thank you. By virtue of that reading, this will flow through our uh, legislative process and we'll come back to this committee. Uh, next are ordinances for second read. Um, first item is 21006. Seven six seven. If you could please read that in. It's an ordinance by Council Member Andrea Boone authorizing the mayor or her designee to amend SPS one two one zero three to follow away services supplemental staffing with Georgia Works Incorporated on behalf of the Department of Public Works to extend the term of the agreement for nine months retroactively, effective from November twenty first, twenty one through July twentieth, twenty twenty two. In accordance with the provisions of Section 21163 of the City of Atlanta Code of Ordinances and tax funding in an amount not to exceed $150,000 in zero cents, all contracted work to be charged to and paid from the funding numbers listed herein and for the purposes. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Braswell, are you here to speak to this? Is Ms. Braswell on the line and unmuted? Good morning, morning Chair. I did this. Is, okay. Rita Braswell. Okay, you can go on. You can go on, Ms. Braswell. 
Thank you. Uh, again, this is Rita Braswell with the Department of Public Works. The purpose of this resolution is to authorize an amendment to the reference special procurement agreement in the amount of $150,000. The Department of Public Works Office of Solid Waste Services has been dramatically impacted by an inordinate amount of COVID-19 pandemic related absenteeism. The city has had to deal with large scale disruptions in the collection of garbage, illegal dumping, recycling and yard trimmings, and the chronic nature of the backlog has led to unsightly, unhygienic, and most uh, importantly, dangerous conditions in the city. In an effort to abate these conditions, DPW previously solicited several qualified firms to provide temporary personnel support. The solicitation ultimately resulted in one successful proponent, Georgia Works, being selected to support the department with this effort. Georgia Works provides labor support to augment curbside collections. The original special procurement agreement was executed July 21st, 2021, with an expiration date of November 20th, 2021, in an amount not to exceed $999,000. Um, amendment number one will extend the agreement nine months um, and add additional funding in an amount not to exceed $150,000. Georgia Works has provided support satisfactorily in the past, and the department requests approval of this amendment. Thank you, Ms. Braswell. Um, we will hear from the commissioner after the legislative items and get an update on um, all things public works. So uh, we certainly realize that uh, y'all need the help. I'll go ahead and make a motion to approve. Second, Boone. All right, any uh, comments or questions from the committee? If not, we'll go ahead and open up the vote. Um, Mr. Chair, before we um, open up that vote, if there can be a supplemental um, uh, motion, this does need to be amended. It's saying retroactive in the caption, effective November 21st. However, the body uh, reads October 1st, which is indeed the retroactive date. If there could be a um, substitute motion to amend the legislation first. Certainly, I'll go ahead and make that um, motion to uh, make those changes as a substitute. Is there a second? Sure. All right, if you could please open up the vote vote on the substitute. The vote is open. Council Member Winslow? In favor. Council Member Boone? Yes. <clears throat> the vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. The amendment is before you. All right. Five yeas, zero nays. The amendment is here. I'll go ahead and make a motion to approve the amended legislation. Second. Please open up the vote. The vote is open. Councilmember Winslow? In favor. Councilmember Boone? Yes. The vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. This item is favorable as amended. All right. Five yeas, zero nays. This is uh, favorable. Next item is uh, number three, and that uh, is Resolution 21R4065. If you could please read that in. The resolution by City Utilities Committee authorized the mayor or her designee to add amendment number two to existing task order number 143 for SC 7383A, Architectural, Engineering, and Design Services with Arcadis, Joint Venture, a joint venture of Arcadis, GNM Incorporated, and Brindley Peters and Associates Incorporated to provide landfill post closure care and operations and maintenance for the Key Road, Cascade Road, Gun Club Road, and United Avenue landfill, including any unscheduled maintenance and emergency work on behalf of the Department of Public Works in an amount not to exceed $400,000 in zero cents. All contractor work to be charged to and paid by the fund, department, organization, and account numbers listed herein and for the purposes. And we do have an okay. amendment to this. Okay. Oh, um, what is the nature of the amendment? 
the amendment updates um, any references to United Avenue to East Confederate Avenue throughout the legislation. Okay, I'll go ahead and make a motion to bring forth the uh, amendment. Second. Second. All right, please open up the vote. The vote is open. Councilmember Boone? Yes. Councilmember Winslow? In favor. The vote is closed, five yeas, zero nays. The amendment is before you. All right, five yeas, zero nays. Uh, Ms. Lipson, are you on the line to speak with us? Good morning. <clears throat> this is Carla Lipson with the Department of Public Works. Uh, this legislation is to add funding to an existing contract for the landfill post closure care for landfills. And this is needed because we are waiting for the current solicitation, the current A&E solicitation to be finalized and awarded. Uh, landfill post closure care activities include groundwater, methane, and pretreatment discharge sampling, planned and unplanned maintenance, data reporting, review and submittals, as well as landfill maintenance and gas system repairs. All right, thank you. I'll move approval. Second, Winslow. Questions or comments? As amended. Thank you. Uh, hearing none, let's go ahead and open up the vote. The vote is open. Council Member Ben. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. The vote is closed. The vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. This item is favorable as amended. Thank you. Five yeas, zero nays. Item is favorable. Next item is 21R4066. If you could please read that. Ahead. A resolution by City Utilities Committee authorized the mayor or her designee to enter into a memorandum of understanding and contract item agreement with the State of Georgia Department of Transportation on behalf of the Department of Watershed Management for the purpose of adjusting water and sewer facilities that are in conflict with GDOT's intersection improvement project in an amount not to exceed $266,383.15. All contracted work will be charged to and paid from the fund, department, organization, and account number listed herein and for the purposes. Thank you. Um, Mr. Picaro, are you on the line to speak to us about this? Uh, good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chair and Council Members. Uh, this is Rob Caro with the Department of Watershed Management. Uh, this legislation is to request funds um, in the amount not to exceed $266,383.15 for construction services related to one of Georgia DOT's intersection improvement projects. It's a PI number 0011845. Uh, the GDOT is sponsoring an intersection improvement project with Fordham County, which is located at the intersection of Roosevelt uh, Highway, SR14 and Washington Road. Uh, watershed management has various uh, existing facilities that present a conflict uh, for the project. Uh, as a result, watershed management scope work will consist of relocating, removing, abandoning and, and adjusting some of the facilities to accommodate the project. Uh, therefore, this legislation is requesting the re required construction services funding to perform the required utility relocation work. Uh, there is, uh, within the legislative package, a location map. Um, let me know if you have any questions. Thank you, Mr. McCarr. Questions or comments? I'll move approval. Thank you. All right, second, Chuck. Things open the vote. The vote is open. Councilmember Winslow. In favor.
The vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. This item is favorable. All right, five yeas, zero nays. Uh, this item is favorable. Next item is 21R4067. If you could please read that in. The resolution by City Utilities Committee to amend resolution 21R3746, adopted by the Atlanta City Council on August 16, 2021, and approved by Operation of Law per City Charter Section 2403 on August 25, 2021. To correct the dates for the second renewal term for SB 9838, Program Management Services with Stantec SG joint venture to commence on October 29, 2021 and end on October 28, 2022, and the date for the first renewal term to commence on October 29, 2020 and end on October 28, 2021. Mr. Bacaro. Yeah, Rob Bacaro, Department of Woodshed Management. As the caption mentioned, uh, the legislation is required to amend uh, legislation related to the program management services contract, FC 9838, uh, recently under resolution 21R3746, uh, was authorized to exercise the second renewal option under agreement FC 9838. That's the program management services uh, agreement with Stantec SG joint venture for a term of one year, effective October 30th, 2021 through October the 29th, 2022, and an amount not to exceed $9 million. Uh, it also authorized the execution of the third amendment to the agreement to add funding for services rendered during the term of the agreement in the amount not to exceed $1,400,000. The resolution needs to be amended to correct the dates for the second renewal term to October the 29th, 2021 through October the 28th, 2022. It will also correct the dates of, for the first renewal term to October the 29th, 2020 through October the 28th, 2021. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Bacaro. I'll make a motion to um, amend as uh, outlined. Second. Please open the vote. And this is just the vote to approve the um, amendments to the renewal term. Um, the vote is open. Councilmember Winslow? In favor. The vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. This item is favorable. Five yeas, zero nays. This item is favorable. Do we need to do anything else with this, or is that? Uh, um, that is it, that does conclude it. It was a corrective um, item, a corrective legislative item. Okay, great. Next item is twenty one R four zero six eight. If you could please read that in. It's a resolution by City Utilities Committee authorizing the mayor or her designee. To execute the second amendment to agreement SC10387, large meter accuracy equipment and analytics with OLEA Networks Incorporated to add funding to the agreement in an amount not to exceed $3,960,625.00 to purchase an additional 2,123 monitoring units to exercise the second renewal option under the agreement for a term of one year effective from December 6, 2021 through December 5, 2022, and an amount not to exceed $3,020,000.00. On behalf of the Department of Watershed Management, all contract work will be charged to pay from the account numbers listed and for other purposes. Thank you. Mr. Hawkins, are you here to speak to us about this? Yes, I am. Good morning, I'm Eric Hawkins. Watershed Management. Um, this is renewal number two for contract SC 10387, annual contract for large meter testing and accuracy for our ALEA uh, smart metering and analytics devices that monitor the internal components of large meters to help them in the body air to maximize water revenue for the park. Uh, this renewal also includes that funding for the installation of 2,123 devices. This technology and device helps us determine the effectiveness of meter repairs and whether repairs were completed successfully. It's designed to detect water depth also by meter bypasses. Uh, if the meter bypasses are tampered with, uh, that creates a meter water. 
Uh, it also helps us determine why the patient's property leaves and underbills account due to poor performance of the meters uh, requiring repair or replacement. Uh, we are very pleased with the technology which, ha which has helped the department to build and increase its revenue of over $5 million. This technology also replaces our annual meter testing program, which was limited to visual inspection of our meters and not its internal components. That concludes my explanation. All right, thank you, Mr. Hawkins. Um, Ms. Kimson Wright, is there an IPRO report that goes along with this? Um, no, Mr. Chair, we don't require an IPRO for this one. Um, this is a um, renewal um, to the initial contract that was authorized. Great. All right, thank you very much. Uh, comments or questions from the committee? Shook with a question. Yes. Uh, so we're, uh, this allows us to acquire an additional 2,123 uh, monitoring devices. How many do we currently have you know, that are operational? Yeah, the our initial pilot, we deployed about 750 devices um, uh, over our two-year uh, pilot time frame. Um, so it gave us an opportunity to really evaluate proof of concept with the technology. And we've been very pleased with the results. Um, it also aided in, um, as I mentioned, additional revenue dollars uh, as a result of us identifying problematic meters, uh, where this technology helped us to uh, uncover um, and get those meters repaired or replaced. Okay. So these are, is this a, a kind of a, a single size unit that can be, that, that can monitor different size meters? Well, we specifically use it for large meters. Um, it's a device that attaches to the meter itself. Um, so it, you know, it's installed on the, on the meter. Okay. And do you have a list of places that you're going to quickly de deploy these to? That can be ordered an awful lot. Yeah. So the, 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 the um, intent here is to outfit the remaining um, large meters. Uh, with these devices in our uh, distribution system. Um, so all large meters will have uh, the device on them. So, okay, so the goal is have all existing large meters have one of these permanently attached? That is correct. Okay. And so I guess that means that the... Uh, You've had a lot of success thus far with your 700 and however many existing units. Um, the fact that, well, let me, let me put it to you this way. You, you've obviously uncovered an awful lot of problems with what the original meters have said, correct? That is correct. The, the, the advantage of this device, it allows us to understand what's happening inside of the meter. Previously, we, we, you know, we had a um, metering um, inspection program where right. it, it only focused on what was happening outside of the meter. So that's the distinction between this uh, technology. It helps us to understand a meter, a meter in the event that is in a process of failing. And are, are, these, uh, are, are these large meters, are they... Are they run on a telemetry system? I'm sorry, I, I don't understand. What I do this group is to, to, to these large meters uh, report via telemetry their readings? Yeah, they these, are, yeah right. these meters, we, we collect the readings um, remotely. Well, and you tell me if I'm wrong, but it, it sounds like the department believes we have a whole lot of large meters that aren't working properly. No, we're not saying that. We're, what we're saying is we want to be able to be in a position with, with the best technology to help us understand we have a problem before it happens. Um, that's what this technology is designed to do. So we also want to be able to maximize our revenue because you know, we know the older our meter gets, the less water it calibrates over time. So we are able to determine, you know, what that 
we, we're able to do analysis to determine what our losses are and help us drive decision making in terms of whether we want to replace the meter or simply make some repairs to the meter. Okay, so meters are being replaced when it's deemed appropriate as absolutely. Uh, absolutely. All right, just point out. All right, I, I still get the impression that there are some problems uh, with the original meters that we're having to take these steps to correct. Um, but um, I'll let someone well, else say Go ahead. Yes, I want to make sure I express that the, the goal of this technology is is part of our uh, smart metering program. And, and what that does for us, it, it helps us to understand how we're building, how effectively we're building. Um, it's not to say that we're not, it's not to say that we're not confident that our meters are performing well. It just alerts us if there's a problem with the meter. Um, and for that reason, a visual inspection, you can go years without detecting any problems inside of the meter. So what this technology does, it helps us really understand that we're ahead of time and, and allows us to be proactive in mitigating the issue. Okay. We, do have meters in our, we do have meters in our system that requires replacement. I understand. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Sure. Certainly. Other comments or questions? All right. Hearing none, I'll make a motion to approve. Is there a second? Second, Winslow. Second, Winslow. All, right. All right, second, Winslow. Please open the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. This item is favorable. All right, five days, zero days. So I think it's favorable. Next item is number 721R4069. If you could please read that. The resolution by City Utilities Committee authorized the mayor or her designee to execute the First Amendment to Agreement FC1190078, Green Infrastructure Design Challenge. Martin Luther King at Hunter Place with Star White House Landscape Architects and Planners LLC on behalf of the Department of Watershed Management to extend the term of the agreement to January 31st, 2022 at no additional cost and for other purposes. All right, thank you. Commissioner Browning, are you here to speak with us? Hey, good morning, council members. This is Nikita Browning, Department of Watershed Management. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good morning. Hey, good morning. The purpose of this legislation is to seek approval to execute the First Amendment for the Star White House Landscape Architects and Planners, Green Infrastructure Design Challenge at Martin Luther King at Hunter Place for time only. Uh, the contractor is assisting with completing green infrastructure installation within the vacant lot that is located near the intersection uh, in question. The project will maximize infiltration on the empty parcel, reconnect the existing storm sewer for overflow management, and manage on-street flooding. The project experienced delays during the design phase as a result of required coordination with a larger most project that is addressing street flooding and is and to allow for coordination of permit review period and the necessary support services. Subject to your questions, this completes our, our project overview. Thank you, Commissioner. Questions or comments from the committee? Ooh, approval. I'll second that. Please open the book. The vote is open. Council Member Winslow? In favor. The vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. This item is favorable. All right, five yeas, zero nays. Uh, this item is favorable. Next item is number eight, which is 21R4069. 
4070. If you could please read that. The resolution by City Utilities Committee authorizes the mayor or her designee to execute the First Amendment to Agreement SFS 1210049. Continuous monitoring and adaptive control system for stormwater management with or Opteric Incorporated on behalf of the Department of Watershed Management to have services and funding for replacement parts and labor in an amount not to exceed four thousand seven hundred dollars and zero cents. All contracted work to be charged can pay from the account numbers listed and for the purposes. Thank you. Commissioner Brown. Uh, Makita Brown again, Department of Watershed Management. Uh, purpose of this legislation is to seek approval to execute the First Amendment uh, for SS 1210049, continuous monitoring and adaptive control system for stormwater management with Opteric on behalf of Watershed Management in amount not to exceed $4,700. Uh, the contractor is assisting with completing installation of the device and components that will assist with controlling flow levels within the Dean Rust retention pond. The part was requested as a result of an assessment that was conducted during deployment. Uh, the part is needed for functionality of the flow control system and will address the need to clean and maintain the retention pond and more efficiently control flow release from the pond and prevent flooding in the surrounding neighborhood. Uh, subject to your questions, this completes my project overview. Thank you, Commissioner. Questions or comments from the committee? No approval, sure. I'll second that. Please open the vote. The vote is open. Councilmember Winslow? In favor. The vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. This item is favorable. All right, five yeas, zero nays. Uh, this item is favorable. Are there any items that are going to be coming off of Feld, Ms. Kempson Wright? Um, yes, uh, Mr. Chair, items number 10, 12, and 13. All right, if you could please uh, read item number 10, which is 2100721. It's an ordinance on City Utilities Committee authorizing the Chief Financial Officer to amend the FY 2022 Water and Wastewater Renewal and Extension Fund and the security surcharge fund budget in the amount of $1,325,818.00 to transfer funds from watershed reserves and the security surcharge fund for the appropriations and add funds to the patient center project and for the purposes. Thank you. Mr. Picaro, are you here to speak to us about this? Yes, Mr. Chair, um, Council Members, uh, Rob Picaro, Woodshed Management. Um, um, under um, the, sorry, the patent center project is a very, very uh, key project for watershed management. Uh, when it's complete, the facility will consolidate the functions of the Office of Linear Infrastructure Operations with a new operation center, uh, provide a, a training center and warehouse storage facility at the former Payton Pipe Yard. Uh, when completed, the uh, Payton Center will enhance the efficiency of sewer operations, improve material storage capabilities, and enhance uh, staff training capabilities. Um, under item 210072, the purpose of the legislation is to add uh, $1,325,818.00 of funding to the Payton Center project. Uh, so that we can uh, provide uh, high strength security fencing and enhance the operational aspects of, of, of the building. Uh, I'll, I'll also present uh, item 12 in, in, in a moment as well. All right, um, Ms. Kimson Wright, are those two uh, items 10 and 12 that we should take as a block? Um, yes, we can take them as a block. One is the funding and one is the actual agreement. You could please read. Um, Number 12 in place. Yes. At 21R4033, a resolution by City Utilities Committee authorizing the mayor or her designee to execute an agreement for FCRFT C121-0013, Payton Center Design Bill with Winter Judson Lewis Contracting, a joint venture comprising of Winter Judson Group, 
a joint venture, and Lewis Contracting Services, LLC, for professional design and construction services on behalf of the Department of Watershed Management for a term commenced from the date a notice to proceed is issued of 730 calendar days for substantial completion and 880 calendar days for final completion in an amount not to exceed $55,596,000 in zero cents. All contract award will be charged to pay from the account numbers listed and for the purposes. And Mr. Chair, we do have an amendment to add the item to of this item. All right, thank you. Um, Mr. Picaro. Yeah, thank you, uh, Council Member Masakai. Yeah, um, under 21R4033, uh, this legislation is to recommend awards of RFP C1210013 Patent Center Design Build to Winter Johnson Lewis Contracting, a joint venture in the amount not to exceed $55,593,000 and zero cents. Uh, Department of Watershed Management received uh, proposals uh, in response to the RFP. Uh, the RFP, uh, sorry, the evaluation panel received and reviewed three responsive proposals uh, from um, Choate EDT, a joint venture, Reeves Young, Bryson LLC, and Winter Johnson, who is contracting the joint venture. Uh, the, Evaluation Committee entered into negotiations with Winter Johnson Lewis Contracting Joint Venture that had the highest score. Uh, the negotiations resulted in a cost proposal of 55,593,000 that included a number of enhancements, uh, including additional lockers and breakout room in the warehouse, additional driveway connecting public and truck parking, and a high strength perimeter fencing. Uh, the cost proposal was less than the engineer's opinion of probable construction costs, apart from the uh, $1,325,818 for the high-strength security fencing, hence the um, additional funding request. But the IPRO uh, report work has been included with, with the legislation. Um, uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, Shook with a question. Yes, Mr. Shook. Yeah, did the IPRO flag any deficiencies or issues? Uh, Council Member Shook, no, there, there were no deficiencies. Okay, thank you. I'll um, I'll move the amendment at uh, the IPRO. I'll second. Please open the vote to. Uh, and then just add the IPRO. The vote is open. Council Member Winslow? In favor. Council Member Boone? Yes. The vote is closed. Five yay, zero nay. The item is amended and both items are before you for approval. All right, five yay, zero nays. These items are before us. Uh, any questions or comments from the committee about these items? I'll move approval of both. All right, is there a second? Winslow second. Please open the vote. The vote is open. Council Member Bone. Yes. Oh, the vote is closed. Five yay, zero nays. This item is favorable as amended. And um, Mr. Chair, Mr. Jones um, from the Inspector General's Office and the Division of Independent Procurement Review has requested to speak. There were a few um, technicalities I just think he wanted to share with you all. All right. Very good. Mr. Jones. Good morning, Council Members. Uh, this is Michael Jones with the Office of uh, Inspector General. 
Um, the items that we point out in the IPO report, um, the first one, and these have been responded to by the, the Department of Procurement, uh, CPO, um, uh, Martin Clark. Um, first one, the recommended awardee um, answered yes to um, form two, which is the contract disclosure declaration form, which indicated um, prior con contracts with the city, but did not provide that uh, the, pre the information on the previous contracts, which are required by the solicitation. And as you know, this gives the uh, Department of Procurement an opportunity to, to see not just previous work, but actually the performance on that particular work. Uh, also, the majority partner of that joint venture also submitted self-prepared financial statements where the contract, where the contract, uh, which is the contract there's financial disclosure form, but didn't provide all of the bank references uh, for the self-prepared uh, statements. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, in that particular instance, the uh, reference the, the, we require two references uh, in that in that particular instance. Um, the minor, minority partner of the joint venture, which is a separate uh, joint venture uh, that was responsive, also submitted uh, uh, form three, but did not provide a signed letter from the CPA firm. And this may be reflected in the in risk is score, but it still it did not uh, include a letter from the CPA firm indicating that 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 those financial statements were uh, were certified. Uh, the majority minority partner of the North the joint venture also submitted uh, form three, but did not include the letter from the CPA firm. <clears throat> and the last one, which is uh, uh, an additional discrepancy for um, a proponent that was not uh, responsive, um, the offeror submitted four of the required submittal forms as a joint venture, but. Um, because the joint venture was less than three years. Uh, excuse me. Uh, because partnership is less than three years, this station requires the joint venture to submit a to submit separate documentation. Um, the next item was both the majority and majority partners of the joint venture submitted safety records uh, record form and answered yes, but did not provide the supplemental um, uh, safety documentation that we require as a, a part of the solicitation. Uh, contrary to the solicitation requirements, the offer did not submit the authorized transaction to uh, the authorization to transact business in the state of Georgia for the minority partner and the minority partner of the joint venture. And these were the findings that were also responded to by the Department of Procurement. All right, thank you for uh, highlighting those. What, what were the responses to uh, those items? On the first one, the Department of Procurement waived the the uh, form two for the recommended awardee as a minor technicality. On form three, the Office of Risk Management evaluated uh, that that particular discrepancy and it was reflected in their score. On the next item, the solicitation only required form one, two, and three to be submitted for the newly formed joint venture. The rest of the forms can be submitted together as long as they were in the name of the joint venture. In this case, there were, they were so uh, DOP finds it acceptable. And the safety forms are evaluated by the user agency during the scoring session. Okay. Um, how would you characterize um, the, I guess, the items that you've listed in the responses? Do you, do you believe um, uh, they were insignificant? Do you believe they were significant? Um, uh, do you believe the responses were appropriate? How, could, could you give us some some thoughts there? Anything that's that's required in the solicitation, we think is is important, and um, there we believe that there should be um, a strong reason if it's waived as a technicality, um, and we're 
not we're not trying to second guess the Department of Procurement's uh, determination that it was a bit technicality. But as we go through our review, when we when we find things that that um, that are requirement in the procurement process, um, we're um, we're looking for strong evidence to either waive it as a as a technicality or um, something that will give um, give that will give us good indication that the that the policy and the and the and the and the forms are being completed appropriately, fairly, and consistently with DOP's processes. Okay. And did you get that comfort? In some instances yes, in some instances in some instances no. Um, Whenever there is findings with the recommended awardee, we always um, we always want to be comfort. We always want to have comfort in knowing that our findings um, have been thoroughly reviewed and um, recognized with with uh, with the proper care. That there may be some underlying issues that. Um, our review may not uncover. So with that, the recommended award is just having that that issue with it. Um, just, you know, we, we want to be sure that that uh, a thorough review was done and, and instead of just uh, waiving uh, the procurement, waiving their that specific requirement. All right. Um, I guess I'd like to hear from uh, Chief Procurement Officer as to whether the federal review was done. Uh, is Mr. Clark on the line? Good morning, uh, Chair uh, Matsukai. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good morning. There you go. Perfect. Well, good morning. Uh, I I am responding to the inquiry with regards to the IPRO report. The Department of Procurement, of course, greatly appreciates the work that uh, the IPRO team does in reviewing uh, the, uh, the department's uh, compliance with our, our procurement procedures. Uh, but I want to make sure that we have a, a, you have a granular feel for some of the uh, decisions that are made and also making it clear that this is through the optic of making sure that we have viable awardees uh, and that we also don't uh, find non-responsive um, vendors that really should go through. Uh, as uh, I think members of this, this committee may recall, we were going through a time where we were finding so many vendors non-responsive for minor technicalities. And an example would be, uh, for, for instance, the waiver of the, the contracts previous. So if, let, for instance, a vendor has had multiple years of contracts at the city and may have uh, missed one or so that, the, uh, you know, that may have been listed or, or so, Again, should we find that vendor non-responsive for that uh, that technical deficiency? Um, we have a history of of putting or uh, finding so many vendors non-responsive for those types of examples. So, as a call, again, we are trying to allow as many viable vendors to go through the process after spending so much time, effort, resources, and and money to prepare these uh, these bids and to make sure that they are at least given a chance to uh, to uh, fight it out uh, to, to win those contracts. And that's an example, hopefully, that, that the committee uh, can sense what the, the Department of Procurement is doing. Again, we greatly appreciate uh, IPRO's uh, work. It absolutely has improved. And 
even though this particular one had a number of findings, what uh, has actually happened over the last uh, year or so, IPRO has a, allowed uh, DOP to absolutely improve uh, our, our review process, and uh, and actually we are trending in the opposite direction of actually having these things go through with with less findings. So um, the the relationship is working. Uh, uh, Councilman Matsukite. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Clark. Uh, comments or questions from the committee? Yeah, sure. Um, so, I think we're all familiar with the comments that have been made by the presenters here. In fact, there was a time in the night too distant past when a whole lot of uh, city business that had to be transacted was grinding to a halt that contracts had to be extended and extended and extended because uh, vendors, some vendors were being knocked out, um, you know, because uh, there was a form that had been submitted in one place and in a different place, the same information was required, was it? you know, repeated there, but it had already been put somewhere else. And so we did give the CPO authority to exercise, you know, some discretion over uh, those kinds of technicalities. It sounds like the IPRO team has done what we wanted them to do, which is um, clap on the green eye shade and go over everything and list all the omissions, you know, flaws and errors that they find. And, uh, you know, they're not required to make judgment calls. Ultimately, of course, that falls to us um, here and now. I'm, while I do have some angst about the emissions, which I'm grateful to hear about from IPRO, and I'm glad the Inspector General uh, jumped on this call, um, it appears to me that these flaws aren't fatal and we need the business of the city to continue. So I'm going to be supportive of moving this along. That said, um, I hope I pro, you know, keeps their nose to the grindstone and, and calls out flaws and omissions so that uh, things can get tightened up uh, moving forward. I, I certainly don't want to, I feel like I'm contributing to uh, a loosening of, uh, of a machine. It took us a lot of time and effort uh, to put together, Mr. Chair. So I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, move approval. Okay, I, th I think we had already approved. Is that right, Ms. Kimson, right? Yeah, that's right. Yes, okay. we have. In, in, any other members have questions or comments? All right, hearing, hearing none. Um, Let's go ahead to uh, item, the final item, which is item number 13. If you could please read that in. Um, yes, 21R4034. It's a resolution by City Utilities Committee authorized the mayor or her designee to execute an agreement for IFB C1210217 East Area Water Quality Improvement for Flexibility FLC on behalf of the Department of Watershed Management for a term to commence from the date the notice of receipt is issued of 408 days for successful completion for 540 days for final completion in an amount not to exceed $13,844,850.00. All contract awards to be charged to and paid from the account numbers listed. All right, thank you, Mr. Beccaro. Yeah, Rob Beccaro, Department of Woodshed Management. Uh, the East Area Water Quality Control Facility uh, needs upgrades and repairs to restore the efficiency and reliability in the, in the solid thickening and dewatering and vortex grip removal units um, that also require rehabilitation. In addition, the facility has significant corrosion and the filter building and residual handling units need to be replaced. Uh, this project is uh, being funded under a low interest loan from, from GIFA. Uh, this legislation is to recommend award of IFBC 12102217 East Area Water Quality Control Facility Improvements with Lakeshore Engineering LLC in amount not to exceed 
$844,850.00. The Evaluation Committee met and evaluated four bids uh, for the uh, for this project. Um, they, they included Archer Western Construction LLC, Heavy Constructors Inc., uh, Lakeshore Engineering LLC, and Reeves Young LLC. All the vendors, um, all, all the bidders met the minimum requirements stipulated in the statement of bidders' qualifications. Uh, the lowest bidder was uh, Lakeshore Engineering LLC. Um, the lowest bid uh, was were less than the engineer's opinion of probable construction cost. Um, I understand that the, the IPRO uh, report has been submitted uh, with the legislation package. Uh, and if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you, Mr. Scaro. Uh, questions or comments from the committee? Well, I guess we need to hear from the inspector general or someone with IPRO to describe their report. Certainly. Mr. Jones? Um, Thank you. Okay. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Michael Jones, iProtein. Uh, the only issue with this one, which was um, the evaluation, uh, the CPO's memo, which is signed by the, uh, the CPO, um, it didn't include a uh, the yes check to indicate that the evaluations were approved, but that was resolved by the uh, by the time we uh, submitted the final report. We didn't have any other issues with this this solicitation. All right, thank you. Um, questions or comments from Mr. Jones? I'll move approval. I'll second. Please open the vote. on my screen that there are five yeses, zero noes. Um, this uh, is approved. Ms. Kimson Wright, are you there? She may have gotten dropped off the call, but that concludes our legislative items. And the next section on the agenda are the uh, presentations, and I believe Commissioner Wiggins is here to uh, give us a presentation about Department of Public Works. Mr. Wiggins. You able to hear Mr. Department of Yes, we are. Good morning. Okay, good morning again. Um, I would just like to provide a brief recap of our departmental challenges and actions taken to address the challenges with yard trimming collections. As you are aware, uh, DPW has faced a series of challenges, <clears throat> excuse me, since the onset of the pandemic that has significantly impacted our ability to maintain our previous yard trimming collection cycles. Some, but not all of our challenges have involved the current national labor shortage. As you know, the very competitive market right now for both laborers mm -hmm. and drivers. Um, we've also dealt with absences due to COVID-related absences, which aren't always directly related to sicknesses. Um, we've also had to quarantine crews and office staff due to direct and uh, potential exposure. Um, we also have had an experience, excuse me, an uptick in injuries, and we believe this is uh, primarily due to uh, working extended hours and uh, and the crews that are working overtime. So we, we have to be very careful of uh, the use of overtime as it relates to employee-related injuries. Um, I would like, also like to remind our listeners of the priority of curbside collections. I think there may be some confusion surrounding our methodology. 
A solid waste, of course, is our first priority and recycling is the second. Yard trimming is the third. And this is just simply because uh, if we allow yard, excuse me, recycling and trash to remain at curbside, we will experience health and sanitation issues. Next slide. Um, I'd like to give you a brief overview of our multi-step approach to our staffing challenges. Uh, with the help of the Department of Human Resources, we have hired over 40 employees in the last 60 days. Uh, which is, is very significant. And a lot of hard work has uh, taken place to get uh, the additional 40 staff members on board. We've extended overtime opportunities to other departments statewide. Uh, we've augmented our yard trimming crews with staffing from other divisions in the Department of Public Works. We've also utilized office staff to drive trucks. Uh, most recently, with the help of the Department of Procurement and the Department of Law, contracted, contracts have been drafted in record time to partner with two local landscaping firms, which are Russell and Ed Castro Landscaping. Uh, They're scheduled to begin work next week. We're really appreciative of, of both landscaping firms' willingness to venture into uh, what is uncharted waters for them and taking on a project uh, when traditional waste haulers were really reluctant to do so. Both companies have made significant capital purchases to acquire the equipment needed to perform this new line of work. So again, we're very appreciative of their willingness to partner with the city on this endeavor. Um, we continue to work extended hours. Our crews are working up to nightfall and through weekends and holidays. Um, and we also place an emergency bid for temporary staffing uh, through the use of employment agencies, uh, we received uh, five responses to the emergency bid. As you know, we have um, sent out a RFP previously. We did not receive the response that we were looking for. Uh, we have reached out to various temp agencies to find out why the lack of interest occurred. We understood it later on that there were some insurance limitations that prevented them from participating. And so we targeted our search to employment agencies that would be able to meet our insurance and indemnification requirements. Um, we've developed recruiting and re uh, retention incentives that have worked well. Um, last, but certainly not least, we're very appreciative of the premium pay incentive recently approved by the Mayor and Council. I'm confident that the incentive will significantly improve our staffing position. Next slide. Um, I would like to also give you a brief overview of our multi-step approach as it relates to the introduction of new equipment and technology. Um, we're in the process of procuring new routing software to assist with deploying our vehicles and staff more efficiently. We'll also install tablets and other devices in our truck to provide better communications with our drivers while they're working out in the field. We're also in the process of procuring automated vehicles. Um, this will help to reduce the amount of staffing needed to perform curbside collections, uh, such as single operated uh, trash trucks. And we're also purchasing trucks that do not require a commercial driver's license to operate. Um, we're hopeful with the automated trucks specifically that this will reduce the amount of employee injuries that we're currently experiencing also. We're also in the process of establishing two additional yard trimming drop-off sites that should be established in two weeks or less. Before I conclude my presentation, I would like to thank the hardworking women and men of DPW for their hard work and commitment to the city. With that, I am open to address any questions that you may have, Chairman. All right, thank you. Um, colleagues, any questions or comments for the commissioner? All right. Hearing none, we'll let you get back to work and uh, get on that truck. Are you driving a truck, Commissioner? <laughs> Not yet. It, it, it looked like that might be a possibility. <laughs> well, good. We at least want to see on the back of one. <laughs> yes, sir. All right. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. Next, certainly.
Um, next, we have our clean energy plan update. And um, Mr. Seidel, are you on the line to give us that update? I am. This is John R. Seidel. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Oh, Please proceed. Awesome. Awesome. Um, and, and just a heads up, I couldn't see the slides on the last presentation on the live stream. So um, I um, let me know if you have them in front of y'all, and I can kind of just go through, and I'll just say next slide and move to the next one. That sounds good. Please proceed. All right. Well, thank you so much for having me. My name is John R. Seidel. I'm the Director of Sustainability for the Mayor's Office of Resilience. Um, one to kind of give an overview for our uh, clean energy progress uh, in the city of Atlanta. Um, and Shelby Busso, our Chief Sustainability Officer, who gave the presentation uh, to y'all last time, um, followed with this uh, this slide deck as our, um, as our foundation. And as we go through the slide deck, we'll, you'll be able to, to see the updates based upon uh, the date of updates uh, 10, uh, 2021. Um, and so let's go ahead and dive into it. I'm gonna be going through pretty quickly uh, on the slides that have been covered in the past that are more uh, contextual, uh, but just for those who haven't heard, um, uh, either those on council or those who are listening in um, can give them a little bit more background. Um, and so slide two, uh, so to deliver on the mission uh, for Clean Energy, the Office of the Atlanta Sustainability Agenda is divided into two broad themes. Um, so what we work on uh, is mainly number one, uh, to reduce food insecurity across Atlanta by ensuring 85% of Atlantans have access to fresh, healthy food within a half mile of their home uh, or walking distance. And then on the other side, we have our, uh, our climate focus, um, which is what our clean energy work uh, falls into. Um, and so our goal um, for our climate work is not just to reduce carbon uh, and greenhouse gas emissions by 35% by 2025, it is also um, to achieve 100% clean energy by 2035. Uh, and our, progr uh, our progress is measured uh, through uh, and, and, and uh, really focused on, on our transportation building uh, efforts, as well as energy burden, our municipal operations, waste diversion, uh, urban agriculture, city planning, and ecology. Uh, so next slide. Uh, so in May 2017, uh, Atlanta City Council passed Resolution 17R of uh, 3510, which directed the Mayor's Office of Resilience to develop a plan to transition the city of Atlanta operations and community to 100% clean energy uh, by 2035 citywide um, and city operations by 2025. And when city council, next slide, um, and so when city council, um, when we presented our plan uh, and met with everybody individually, um, and, and this slide being focused on what clean energy is defined as, um, energy efficiency, wind, solar, uh, existing and low impact hydroelectrics, geothermal, biogas, waste technology, um, and, uh, and, and going to slide five. In March 2019, Atlanta City Council formally adopted our presented plan uh, to transition to 100% clean energy by 2035, not just for uh, uh, citywide, but also one to specify for the recommendation for uh, city operations to also match that, um, because we wanted to focus on not having to buy uh, renewable energy credits and wanted to prioritize local benefits. Um, going quickly, we had a very, uh, into our next slide around our engagement process, um, very uh, uh, comprehensive uh, and uh, different mechanisms to be able to receive community feedback. Um, and 88% uh, uh, were very supportive of Atlantans um, with 8% uh, being somewhat supportive and only 4% being either not so supportive or not supportive at all. And so going to slide seven, which is um, our priorities for our clean energy work, 
Uh, one, energy efficiency must be a priority. Uh, two, investments in energy efficiency must be increased. And three, local investments in renewable energy must be prioritized over investments outside of uh, Atlanta metro area. Um, and not only do we want to focus on uh, uh, 100% clean energy transition you know, just for our climate emissions, uh, we wanted to focus on it uh, really being uh, an equitable, a model for equitable clean energy transition. And the way that we are uh, excited and kind of different from other cities, uh, not just in the U.S., but internationally, is our focus on energy burdens, uh, which is the percent of household income spent on electricity and natural gas. Um, and this also being the case because Atlanta has one of the highest energy burdens in the United States. Um, as you can see in the, uh, in the graphic on the left, uh, some zip codes have much higher energy burdens. Um, than, uh, than other zip codes, uh, in Atlanta. Um, and so when you're spending, uh, six, uh, up to 9.6%, uh, percent of your household income on just electricity, um, and, uh, your electric bill, um, that's, uh, a real inhibitor on being able to, um, progress and thrive and a life provide for your family. And so that's why, um, uh, when focusing on, on equitable, um, 100% clean energy transition, um, energy equity, energy efficiency um, must be a, an important part of, of getting there, especially in communities uh, that have high energy burdens. So next slide, slide eight. Um, and uh, three different approaches, as uh, I was alluding to just with a little bit more graphics, um, is first, using less energy overall, second, uh, generate more clean energy, and then third, uh, to make up any gaps by 2035, buying renewable energy credits to get to our 100% um, clean energy goal. Uh, on our next slide, slide number nine, uh, as part of the 100% uh, clean energy advance plan, um, there is a list of 70 different policies and programs reviewed based on equity economic development and cost effectiveness potential. Um, and this is, again, important, uh, not just uh, to show the economic feasibility or the economic impact, but also to prioritize uh, overall equity uh, impacts as well. Um, and um, I'm glad to say that uh, many of these programs and projects um, are, that the city has been taking on um, help advance um, all three major priority areas. Uh, and so moving to slide 10, uh, there is a revision schedule that has been part of this plan to update um, the clean energy plan, not just on uh, where we need to go, but also recognizing the progress. And this is uh, an exciting time because we are coming up on uh, the, the next cycle where we want to update this uh, clean energy plan. Um, and the Clean Energy Advisory Board that was a major outcome of passing this clean energy plan is going to be critical um, and, and, and identifying uh, not just the progress, um, but also where we need to go moving forward. And so I'd like to take this time to dive into uh, some of the highlights in the past, but also uh, give some updates based on um, uh, and update some the last conversation and presentation that, that Shelby uh, made for City Council. So on slide 12, um, this focuses on the Clean Energy Advisory Board uh, that I referred to um, that's going to be critical in updating our, our clean energy plan. So for our Clean Energy Advisory Board, we have already had three, uh, three meetings together in this uh, Clean Energy Advisory Board is not just made of, of stakeholders uh, who are experts in the industry. Uh, we take pride and are excited to have representation from, uh, from actually from our community, um, including leaders from uh, different MPUs. Um, and this is so important because if we are just talking clean energy or climate jargon, um, you know, how are you going to, one, be able to communicate uh, opportunities uh, to different communities, um, but, but two, uh, also 
recognize uh, where communities are coming from and how do we solve problems in our community like energy burden um, than by giving uh, community leaders uh, a voice on uh, and, and a role um, for the city uh, to help uh, support um, equitable clean energy policies and programs. Um, and so as part of those three introductory uh, contextual advisory board meetings, uh, we have established uh, different working groups that are going to help um, move the needle uh, for the city. Um, one in equitable energy access, uh, the next building decarbonization, building codes, funding, collaboratives, and reporting and data. Um, and we're excited that next week we're going to be having our fourth uh, clean energy advisory board meeting, uh, moving on from the introductory and contextual board meetings and going more into focusing on what can help move the needle uh, towards this clean energy goal. And so by looking at the next slide, uh, focusing on the American Cities Climate Challenge Grant, um, in 2019, Atlanta uh, was selected along with 25 other cities to scale and implement climate solutions. Um, and, and really, um, not just protecting our economy, um, but also our public health, uh, upgrading our city infrastructure, uh, and to meet the needs as well as uh, the resilience and um, focuses uh, and, and impacts that we can expect not in uh, just this century, but in the future as, uh, as we have more challenging extreme weather events um, as Atlanta continues to grow in population, uh, et cetera. And so I wanted to provide just an update um, because the American Cities Climate Challenge Grant is actually sunsetting uh, this year um, and um, AACCC as actually, um, uh, you know, that has been supported by Bloomberg Philanthropies, um, has actually supported and, and um, focused on um, making sure that Atlanta has uh, the support that it needs to continue to uh, implement our building and transportation policies and programs, uh, and thereby uh, extending uh, support for an extra year. Um, and supporting our, our climate advisor and, um, and going into the in implementation of a lot of our work uh, focused on uh, the building and transportation programs. Next slide focuses on, the next two slides actually, focus on further power and engagement. Um, and so in May of 2019, uh, the city of Atlanta submitted comments uh, to the Georgia Public Service Commission, uh, otherwise known as the PSC, regarding Georgia Power's Integrated Resource Plan, uh, IRP. Um, and the next IRP is actually coming up uh, in the next year as well for 2022. And our Integrated Resource Plan is a 20-year outlook. Um, uh, and, and really, Georgia Power's plan of what uh, what different energies uh, and, and resources um, planning out in the next 20 years of their uh, of their electricity production uh, needs. And so in, in 2019, the city submitted those comments, uh, which helped um, and, and advocated for uh, expanding access to residential energy efficiency and renewable energy programs, continued and improved access to utility data, and increasing access to renewable energy for all sectors, cities included. Uh, and then giving an update for, uh, for, for this presentation, uh, our office is pursuing multiple opportunities to expand renewable energy uh, through existing Georgia Power programs um, that cities have had um, more trouble um, being able to pursue in the past. Um, so uh, exploring um, specifically two programs that would help support and cut costs for expanding electric vehicle infrastructure. We go to the next slide. In October 2019, uh, the city formally uh, intervened in the 2019 rate case, uh, advocating against the proposed rate increases. Um, and the city, as Atlanta participates as part of that, uh, the Public Service Commission's demand side working group, um, and demand side management is really uh, energy efficiency uh, uh, program. So being able to have uh, increased heat um, um, 
and voice at that table for Georgia Power as part of that working group um, is going to continue to, to be important to advocate for programs and for policies and resources for a continued energy efficiency efforts. Um, I also like to point out that as a part of that rate case, um, we are also able to um, save uh, the automated benchmarking tool um, as well as um, support tools and resources uh, that uh, that help enhance more energy efficiency um, programs and, of course, um, help increase our relationship, not just through the demand side management working group, but also in collaborating closely with our, our city rep and opportunities and resources that the city uh, can utilize uh, going forward. And then the city also helping uh, spread the word and communicate uh, different rebates that uh, residential and commercial uh, customers for future power can receive by implementing energy efficiency measures and products. So the next slide, uh, we talked a little bit about uh, energy uh, burden. And in 2020, a two-phase energy burden program framework was developed to provide energy efficiency mm -hmm. interventions to owner-occupied single-family homes and high energy burdened uh, and low-income census tracts. Uh, continued participation in an informal Georgia Power Energy Burden Working Group, uh, which is another mechanism that, um, that the city has been able to participate in because of their engagement efforts that I was referring to in the last two slides, uh, to collaboratively identify and address the needs uh, related to energy, energy burden in Atlanta. And uh, one of those programs that's focused on reducing energy burden through energy efficiency uh, resources and programming um, uh, is focused on here with the upcoming launch of weatherized uh, ATO um, with funding from uh, the American Rescue Plan. The next, and this is a significant update with the uh, Property Assessed Clean Energy uh, Financing Program, also known as PACE. Uh, we'll make funding available to constituents, uh, building orders for energy efficiency on site, renewable energy and water efficiency improvements. This gives another, uh, major financial option up to $20 million per, uh, per building owner. Um, and, uh, since that contract has now been signed between Wagon and Invest Atlanta, uh, more info, uh, can be found, uh, at the website that I Included here from investment Atlanta, um, around commercial pace, and that really would help move the needle um, citywide and energy, not just for energy efficiency and water efficiency um, impacts, um, economic development impacts, um, but as well as moving towards our, our clean energy goal citywide. For solar Atlanta, if we go to the next slide. Um, Slide 18 um, it talks about our Solar Atlanta program, uh, which is a part of the Solar Energy Procurement Agreement, otherwise known as a CEPA. Um, and sorry if the, uh, I don't know if it's the next slide. I'm looking at the presentation right now, but, um, but on slide 18 where it says Sol Solar Atlanta. Um, so along with Cherry Street Energy. And there um, currently I have 14 municipal facilities, including uh, recreation centers and fire stations uh, are currently powered with solar electricity. Um, you can see in 2020, 2019, 2018, uh, the megawatt hours uh, that were produced uh, from the solar installations um, that you can see here. And then just giving some updates, because this is really exciting, in September, the Department of Watershed Management uh, announced an expansion to six DWM sites, which um, which is going to be a significant uh, addition. Um, and so this is something that was just announced in the last month. So the panels aren't installed yet, but when it is, we can start uh, getting these uh, numbers like we have uh, for the past three years. And um, it, it's, it's really exciting because those those six sites are, are, are going to expand our total amount of solar multiple times over. Um, so we're very excited about that. And then um, since the CEPA, uh, the solar energy procurement model is is new as of 2000, 
and 15, so I should say fresh, but there's so many stakeholders, organizations, um, and local governments that are still learning about it. And that, uh, so scaling the super model is really important. So Fulton County, um, as well as organizations like Emory University have taken the CEPA model that the city has modeled and, um, and have scaled it to their own, um, organizations. Um, and so, uh, we actually hosted a CEPA workshop along with Fulton County, uh, and Macon, uh, to other governments, Gwinnett, um, Savannah and others, um, to help scale up the model. And if you have any contacts, uh, for any organizations, or uh, or other local governments, uh, we would appreciate helping spread the word. Uh, the next slide for SolarRise Atlanta, um, which is a bulk purchasing crowdsource program. Uh, we have uh, finalized in 2018, we had SolarRise 1.0, which instead 855 kilowatts residential, as well as 35 kilowatts for commercial and 533.56 kilowatt hours of battery storage. Uh, and as part of that program, uh, in enhancing equity, donated a solar array to Quest Communities of West Atlanta, uh, Atlanta affordable housing development, uh, which will help save them around $5,000 per year. Um, and so for updates for, uh, this year, uh, launched in 2021, um, along with the city of Savannah, uh, participating, uh, in local, uh, LMI, low medium income slow rise cities cohort with RMI and local partners. Um, we already have 312 uh, kilowatts installed through residential. Still working on, on the commercial. So any commercial um, companies looking for uh, the most affordable solar and embedded uh, bedded solar, uh, this is the this is a great program uh, for you to send them more information on. Um, as well as 75 kilowatt hours for total battery storage. Um, and because of the bulk purchasing program aspect of this, uh, the more people that participate, organizations, commercial, uh, as well as residential, the cheaper it is going to be. Um, uh, think of those like the Costco for, for solar as part of, uh, uh, as part of this campaign. Um, and we're going to be, uh, along with, uh, Solar Rise Savannah, there's going to be a solar policy workshop. Actually, today, uh, the 12th at 6.30 p.m. Um, and so any support uh, for anybody who's interested in solar, um, if you uh, get free solar evaluations as a part of this, and it can go to SolarRise Atlanta's uh, website uh, to be able to get that uh, free solar evaluation. Uh, the next slide, the Atlanta Better Buildings Challenge. Uh, our goal was achieved in 2019. Uh, and so I'm, I'm going to go ahead and move forward, but that was obviously really exciting. Um, 20% reductions for water consumption as well as energy consumption by, uh, by 2020. Um, and you know, th those created hundreds of jobs, long lasting, um, energy efficiency jobs as well as water efficiency jobs, um, and helps make our city more resilient while also getting us more towards our 100% clean energy goal. Uh, the commercial building energy efficiency ordinance uh, now requires commercial and multifamily properties uh, to benchmark uh, and track their energy and water use, uh, share their data, uh, and also um, hire professional to identify energy saving opportunities through energy audits. Um, right now, our office is uh, interviewing new candidates for our clean energy program associate role uh, to help continue to, uh, to manage and track this. Uh, in the next slide, the Guaranteed Energy Savings Performance Contract, um, which includes over 35 municipal facilities uh, with Department of Watershed Management, DEAM, DPR, and Airport. Um, but in, in summary, um, there are around 9.9 million guaranteed uh, annual savings, um, and, and that's what helps. Um, that those savings helps what. Uh, what we didn't have to pay up front for uh, not just the audits, but the actual implementation of energy saving uh, measures. Um, as part of our sustainable building ordinance, all new municipal buildings over 5,000 feet have to be LEED silver certified, as well as existing buildings over 25,000 feet. Um, need uh, existing buildings, uh, e-bomb, which for lead e-bomb, which is 
um, operations and maintenance certification um, or existing buildings operation and maintenance certification. Um, and almost done here, we have our electric vehicles, uh, which has had a lot of movement um, in the past uh, year. Um, while we have over 55 electric vehicles to put in our fleet, uh, we also amended our electric vehicle uh, readiness ordinance along with the city of Atlanta. Um, and, uh, sorry, I just had a call right there. Um, and uh, that was uh, done in cooperation, collaboration with the Office of Buildings to make it um, more comprehensive uh, to, to also help specify technical language. Uh, and then um, for updates for, for this year, uh, continuing, we also have the Department of Watershed Management uh, being EV ARC, uh, which is at their 72 Marietta facility, where it is uh, a solar charger uh, that has three different uh, level two plugs for their electric vehicles on site. It's uh, in their parking lot uh, to the left of their uh, to left of DWM headquarters, um, but it also provides uh, energy storage uh, and emergency power. Um, that you can actually plug into um, uh, directly it has a panel on the side that has multiple plugins and multiple cities have used these EV arts to help support community events, COVID, um, uh, COVID testing sites, um, et cetera, and can be a great source for uh, resilient uh, power supply. Um, we're also pursuing vertical power programs, support uh, EV infrastructure, um, and then Atlanta was also featured in the Electrification Coalition Local Government Toolkit, uh, along with Albuquerque, Pittsburgh, Orlando, Cincinnati, uh, which uh, summarizes the best electric vehicle um, supporting uh, policies uh, and really uh, creates a toolkit for any local government to, uh, to, to create a welcoming um, environment to support the electric vehicle transition over time. Um, and then last slide is uh, slide 25, and this goes into our uh, recognition and awards, uh, and really focusing on three different recognitions here. And then uh, first is uh, Atlanta being ranked number 14 uh, in the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy scorecard. Uh, and so measured against 100 major cities in the U.S. around our buildings and energy um, energy efficiency and renewable energy programs and policies and provides a comprehensive national measuring stick for our climate progress and a roadmap for future improvements on energy efficiency, climate, and renewable energy. Um, Atlanta this year was also ranked number four uh, in the EPA's Energy Star Cities rankings, um, only behind Los Angeles, Washington, D.C., and San Francisco. Um, and Energy Star uh, certified buildings are uh, in nature uh, energy efficient uh, certified uh, buildings and, and helps save millions to billions of dollars as part of that um, energy star program across uh, across different cities. And then lastly is lead for cities and communities. And so the city of Atlanta was the 100th city to earn this, uh, this certification uh, under the U.S. Green Building Council's um, city and communities program. The airport uh, was the first airport to do so, and they actually received a uh, lead platinum uh, for cities and communities. Um, and, and then really with that, just going into the general summaries of what I talked about uh, for 2019 through 2021, uh, underneath our solar portfolio, um, our solar Atlanta, our solar rise, uh, ATO 1.0 and 2.0, uh, which is ongoing right now. Uh, and then municipal en renewable energy uh, procurement strategies research. Under the energy efficiency uh, bucket, uh, we have our Atlanta Better Buildings Challenge, which was completed. Our uh, commercial building uh, energy efficiency ordinance, CBEO, uh, the sustainable building ordinance, the guaranteed energy savings performance contracts, and weatherize uh, through American Rescue Plan funding. Uh, underneath the energy equity, which I know can also include our weatherize uh, program uh, from ARP funding, uh, is the energy burden program framework development 
our continued Georgia Power Energy Burden Working Group um, advocacy and, and, and work along with GPC and 100% renewable and equitable uh, cities cohort as a part of uh, RMI WRI. Uh, and then overall engagement, the Clean Energy Advisory Board is going to be a key mechanism uh, for our climate and clean energy work going forward. Um, the Georgia Power 2019 IRP and rate case uh, and the Public Service Commission's demand side management working group. Um, this is the last slide for financing. Uh, property assess clean energy at pace financing with uh, investment banks and Y Green. Uh, collaboration, uh, American Cities Climate Challenge and having that for one more year. Uh, as well as low median income LMI solarized uh, campaign cohort. Underneath research, building decarbonization roadmap uh, development, our uh, greenhouse gas emissions reporting uh, underway, and our Georgia Power Company renewable and EV programs um, research as we continue to look at what's possible in the city to be able to. Um, to be able to, to really utilize uh, possibly going forward. And so just some general next steps, our Clean Energy Atlanta plan update for 2022 uh, with the Clean Energy Advisory Board being a key player in, in, in that and also getting into the details of where progress is for our clean energy work and what we have, uh, what we have to go in the future. And then lastly, uh, renewables and procurement strategy. Um, and then, so we would, uh, along with Shelby, our Chief Sustainability Officer, we would love to take any questions or comments from city council members, but thank you so much for your time and, uh, and your continued support. All right, thank you. Uh, this is Committee Member Howard Shook. Mr. Matsukite uh, had to step away for another commitment and ask me to preside over the long-awaited conclusion to this meeting. Uh, the colleagues, are there any questions uh, regarding uh, the last presentation? Uh, I just up, want to thank any? the I just want to thank the gentleman for a thorough presentation. I mean, it was uh, quite quite um, in depth. So thank you so much. Sounds like a lot of work has been accomplished. Indeed, thank you so much for, for the support. I appreciate your, your positive comments and continued support moving forward. So so let me ask, ask one quick question, because I understand that for solar energy, I mean, I saw something earlier this year, that the federal dollars are no longer in place for people to, to uh, uh, get assistance. Is that correct? I think there, grant there, monies. Uh, there, there is um, there is federal support, um, but, but if there is a specific question around what the, the current um, tax rebates that you get on uh, on solar installations, whether it's commercial or residential, um, I, we can certainly follow up with you know more information uh, with a more comprehensive answer uh, just based on what scale you're looking at okay i mean could you send us some information on you know what what rebates are available now because it, it's probably changed over the years That's and i know some have, i'm sorry what's that I, I didn't mean to interrupt i think it's it's going to continue to uh to change under uh this administration as well Right. So if you could send, send us some, some of the current um, uh, rebates that are available that we could get out to our constituents, that, that would be most helpful. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, thank Mr. you. Any other questions or comments pertaining to uh, that last report? Mm -hmm. Council Member Sheck? Uh, yes, ma'am. 
I, I, I apologize. Um, what's the very last legislative item, item number 13, 21R4034? We only took the vote to bring the amendment forward. Uh, my line was, um, uh, had some technical difficulties, and we need to take the final vote to approve as amended. Okay, understood. Uh, hopefully, uh, we still have a quorum. Uh, I will um, move um, to uh, approve the paper as amended. Is there a second? Second, Winslow. That's been properly moved in second. Let's open the vote. The vote is open. Councilmember Hillen. Councilmember Bone. Boom, yes. Thank you. The vote is closed. Four yeas, zero nays. This item is favorable as amended. All right, thank you. Uh, Ms. Kempson Wright, do we have any other business to attend to today? Um, no, Mr. Chair, this concludes our item today. All right, thank you. Uh, members, any announcements or comments for the go to the body? All right, hearing none, uh, thank you, and we stand adjourned.